Uh, the second on the list is Emily. We all know Emily, so we don't need really to present her. Nevertheless, I'll say that Emily is, of course, the director of the group on arms control and regional security within the INSS and is doing a splendid job. And she has published very extensively on arms control, she published a famous book on the ACAS process, and over the past few years, she has published enormously, I was very impressed, on the Iranian issue and Israeli-Iranian nuclear, possible nuclear relationships. So Emily will speak uh, on the subject from disarmament to missile defense, Obama's nuclear approach. Please, Emily. Thank you, Yael. Yes, you can't shut me up on Iran lately. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about something else, although Iran will be mentioned at the end. I can't resist. Um, in my presentation today, I want to very briefly outline how the uh, arms control slash missile defense slash deterrence dynamic played out during the Cold War years, and then against this backdrop to move to the Obama years in order to highlight new emphases, changes, and some new questions and dilemmas that arise in this regard. So the missile defense deterrence relationship of the US-Soviet Cold War years, I think, is best captured by the famous ABM Treaty of 1972. Ruven mentioned this, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. This treaty that regulated the deployment of missile defense systems between the United States and the Soviet Union and limited them to two sites only was an arms control measure that was designed to curb the nuclear arms race and introduce stability to the MAD dynamic, the mutual assured destruction dynamic. As a measure of stabilization, it sought to temper the dynamic whereby every new missile defense system of one side was viewed by the other as something that needed to be answered in kind in order to maintain effective deterrence. And this was fueling, this was one dynamic that was fueling the arms race, and it was viewed as destabilizing um, and increasing fears, of course, of the hair trigger alert miscalculation. Um, now, the key terms here are deterrence and stability. This arms control treaty, the ABM, was actually grounded in deterrence, but it sought to stabilize the deterrent relationship. Before the ABM treaty, missile defense systems um, were sought by each superpower as an extra layer of protection, an additional source of deterrence. In this case, of course, deterrence by denial rather than punishment. In other words, as a means of denying the other side the ability to strike first effectively. However, the stability of mutual assured destruction rested on the element of mutuality. And cutting missile, defense, uh, missile defenses was viewed as a means of maintaining and enhancing stability, eliminating a source of continued and never-ending arms racing. So deterrence was always at the core. And arms control efforts, including controls on missile defense, were put in place in order to stabilize the deterrent relationship. Now turning to Obama. When Obama was elected president, nuclear arms control came immediately to the fore, as you're all well aware. But in the post-Cold War world, it was not focused exclusively anymore on the US-Soviet bilateral relationship, but was rather manifested in Obama's call for a world free of nuclear weapons. And this engendered a much broader arms control agenda, which encompassed a wider range of initiatives and arms control objectives, including, of course, a very strong emphasis on nonproliferation efforts that were being pursued, of course, in the main vis-a-vis -vis Iran and North Korea. In his, what I call, year of disarmament, um, which uh, lasted from mid-2009 to about mid-2010, the president put a lot of energy 
into this agenda. This included New START, the New START Treaty with Russia, the Nuclear Security Summit that took place in the spring of 2010, securing what he viewed, um, which many view, as a successful nuclear uh, NPT REVCON review conference in May of 2010, and momentum on ratifying the CTBT, which of course did not happen. Now, although the agenda that the president introduced in his first major foreign policy speech in Prague in April of 2009 was called a global disarmament agenda, deterrence and stability have remained at the core of his thinking as well, making it much more a continuation of the kind of thinking that characterized the Cold War experience of the superpowers than anything that resembles classic disarmament type thinking. Obama's disarmament agenda reflected new thinking that was first uh, codified in a, in a significant manner in January 2007 by the four outstanding U.S. statesmen, Henry Kissinger, Sam Nunn, George Shultz, and William Perry, often referred to as the four horsemen. Um, these statement, statesmen called for a world free of nuclear weapons, but in their Wall Street editorials, or op-eds, if you read them, their rationale was anything but classic disarmament ideals, but rather a sense that the nuclear threats had changed. In particular, there was less of a threat from Russia and more of a threat that nuclear weapons may find their way to the hands of terrorists. So the idea was that the U.S. can now afford to reduce its nuclear arsenals, and the terror threat makes it imperative to do so. As I mentioned, though, the notions of deterrence and strategic stability have continued to hold a prominent place in their thinking and in the thinking of the president as well. Direct expressions of this can be found, for example, in a later op-ed uh, from April 2012 that was co-authored by Henry Kissinger and by Brent Scowcroft, where the two expressed their concerns that the United States nuclear reduction might go too far and they might possibly undermine strategic stability rather than enhancing it. The authors in this important op-ed were sounding the warning bell that at the end of the day, what ensured strategic stability was still nuclear deterrence, and that nuclear deterrence must continue to be robust, um, while also relating to additional states in a more complex deterrent equation. And Avner Golov is sitting here, he's doing important work, on this idea of more complex deterrence equations. The theme of strategic stability is also prominent in the nuclear employment document that was released in June 2013 by the, administra by the uh, Department of Defense. The notion that nuclear arsenals could be cut by up to a third, as Obama himself advocated on the same day in his June Berlin speech, rested on the notion that this could be done while maintaining strategic stability. Obama said the nuclear reductions could be made while ensuring the security of the United States and its allies and maintaining a strong and stable nuclear deterrent. It should be noted that there are also some contradictions or at least mixed messages in Obama's approach and policy regarding the U.S. nuclear arsenal. On the one hand, Obama calls for a world free of nuclear weapons, and he appoints a Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel, who is co-author of a report advocating nuclear abolition. But on the other hand, his new Secretary of State, John Kerry, is on record saying that abolition was an aspiration unlikely to be met and that he favored nuclear deterrence. More significantly, Obama's nuclear policy review advocates keeping all three elements of the nuclear triad, and he has plans for upgrading and modernizing U.S. nuclear warheads that are now an issue that's uh, being debated with Congress because these, of course, will cost a lot of money. 
So when considering plans for missile defense in Europe today, the debate is taking place in what I would call an old new context. Old because the U.S. nuclear policy of the Obama administration shows more elements of continuity than a, a break with strategic thinking that was characteristic of the Cold War years. New because the arms control agenda has been broadened. In addition to disarmament, clearly nonproliferation is high priority for the administration with the concrete challenges posed by Iran and North Korea. The United States also needs to maintain stability not only with Russia, but also with China. And this is mentioned explicitly and specifically in the nuclear employment document, again, that was a, a released in June of 2013. The mix of disarmament and nonproliferation with both global and regional agendas intertwined and with deterrence and stability still at the forefront means that plans for missile defense are taking place in a new and much more complex context. And I'll try to tease out some implications and complications that arise from this situation. Missile defense in Europe is being explained by the United States, basically, I'm talking about bottom lines, as, as necessary in order to confront emerging threats um, from the direction of rogue states. And in Europe, of course, this means Iran. Russia's objections to the defensive system are fueled by Cold War thinking similar to the logic that was causing an arms race in the Cold War. Namely, the Russians are complaining, and this was mentioned, of course, by Ambassador Vershbow, and we heard what he said about this. But in any case, the Russians are claiming that the system weakens Russian deterrence. And similar concerns, I think, are raised by China vis-a-vis -vis U.S. claims that missile defense in Asia is only focused on North Korea, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. The result is that the United States is continuing with missile defense, even at the cost of upsetting Russia, and even as it is playing up possible diplomatic movement regarding Iran's nuclear ambitions, namely the famous interim deal. The continued support for missile defense seems to actually be a stronger and more convincing message that's coming from the administration than the guarded optimism with regard to Iran. Um, indeed, continued adherence to missile defense actually underscores implicitly the failure of arms control in its nonproliferation manifestation. The inability to make a convincing argument that Iran will be stopped by ongoing diplomatic efforts. And what about deterrence? In facing a possible nuclear-armed Iran, U.S. missile defense is probably being thought of as an additional layer of protection for European allies beyond U.S. extended deterrence. In the context of ongoing efforts to stop Iran through negotiations, stop it in the nuclear realm, of course, however, deterrence takes on a somewhat different meaning. Um, in that respect, employing missile defense in preparation for failure of the diplomatic effort to stop Iran's military nuclear aspirations has serious negative implications for U.S. deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Iran, because that failure is tied up with a failure on the part of the United States to convince Iran that there will be serious consequences of a military nature if Iran goes for nuclear weapons. Indeed, preparing for a failure to stop Iran indicates that it is Iran's deterrence that has perhaps carried the day. Iran was able to deter the United States from taking military action if indeed Iran becomes a nuclear state and the U.S. has not taken military action by convincing it that the consequences would be too devastating. Um, nevertheless, one should be careful about not necessarily drawing conclusions from weak 
U.S. deterrence in a negotiation situation for its expected strength in a scenario where Iran might actually contemplate use of nuclear weapons. In the latter scenario, it is still probably a, the case that extended deterrence would be strong, backed up by military defense, uh, uh, by missile defense. But these are the kind of questions, I think, that arise in the current much more complex nuclear arms control environment that the United States is grappling with, but of course, uh, states across the globe are grappling with. I'll stop here. I think uh, Azriel uh, Berment, in his uh, remarks, will probably continue somewhat the analysis of, of this question of the implications of Iran going nuclear for this whole uh, topic that we're discussing today. Thank you very much.